This has turned out to be a stupidly busy and snowy one for me, as many of us in Ontario. Um, and I hope everybody is healthy and safe. Uh, if you know of individuals that would be great fits on the call, because what makes this call really work is the interaction, then I would love to have them on the call. That would be, uh, just call out to me and I'll get them on the mailing list. Um, okay, John, we are live on YouTube and uh, ready to start. Okay, uh, we got screen share. We have screen share, go ahead. Okay. Share here. And we'll look over here. So I can see your Some desktop. Way. Oops, wrong way. Dang. Uh, what the heck did I do? Let's go here. Turn that off. And move up the top. So welcome to another session of the Cycle 25 Zoom call. And happy to have you all here. Uh, today we're joined by John to talk about a presentation on uh, essentially ugly balance. Um, I'll let him put the full details in. Uh, over to you, John. Okay. I got to get this where I can start the, start the slideshow. There it goes. Slideshow from the beginning. There we go. Now, everybody seeing this? The, the beam Very antenna good. and the microphone? Yep. Okay, I recommend to all of you, except maybe Rod, that you go up to the and turn off your little uh, your little thumbnails because they'll get in the way of some of the slides. You can do that just by going up to the to them, and there's a little button at the top, a little minus arrow, and if you click on that, all those little all those little things will go away. Okay, let's do this. This presentation, by the way, uh, I'm, I've decided to try something out here. It has QR code blocks in it. If you'd like to, with your cell phone, just click on them, you'll it'll immediately be taken to, to any references rather than having to scramble to, to write down uh, URLs and stuff like that. You can go straight to them with this little QR code block. Just an experiment I'm trying. Seems to work. PowerPoint has a I realize there's an add-on for PowerPoint that lets you create these QR blocks. For any of you who do PowerPoints, you just do this QR add-on. Jim uh, OEK there uh, showed me how to do that. Okay, we're going to talk about the ugly ballon, or what's more technically called the coiled coax ballon, something that hams have known about for years. I think I first remember seeing it years ago on a beam antenna up on the guy's roof where he had four turns of coax uh, all uh, up there as a ballon. But for most hams, these coax ballons are done pretty much by guesswork or word of mouth. Uh, you know, make six turns of coax and you got a ballon. Yeah, that's fine. It works. It's okay. But how does it work? How can you properly design it for maximum efficiency? Well, I wrote an article which came out, was my last article in the magazine, which has been gaining quite a bit of uh, popularity in the February issue on creating your own coax balance. I've learned a great deal more since writing that article, as you will see in this uh, presentation, which by the way, I'm trying out here uh, uh, to, uh, for the ARRL Learning Network. They have uh, had asked me to join them and uh, make presentations there, which I've already done one. And uh, so I, I highly, I highly, uh, uh, very much would ask that any of you who have comments, criticisms, anything, I'm wide open on this presentation because I would like to uh, polish it up for the uh, AWRL uh, webinars where it goes. But that's what this is about, is this article. And you'll see a great deal more in this presentation than was in the article. OK, most hams, one time or another, are probably become aware of doing a ballon this way. Um, see if I can 
turn off those so those little thumbnails don't want to go out, put them over there. Okay, are aware of, of these kind of ballots, sometimes called the ugly ballot, you know, because it's pretty big compared to uh, ferrite ballots and stuff, but uh, uh, they're, pr they're pretty common. But how many hams really know how to design one of these to get the maximum performance out of them, minimize some of their shortcomings? Because they do have shortcomings, although they're a very good way to do a ballot. Uh, the one on the left, of course, is the kind you often see on a beam hanging from the bottom of the beam, or maybe for a vertical, the one in the uh, one in the middle there. How, for example, do you correctly choose the number of turns? How do you correctly choose the diameter? How long to make the uh, to make the ballot? What kind of a form to wind it on? And are there any things that have to do with the band specifically? I think these are all questions about the ugly ballon or the coax ballon that are worth answering that most hams really don't have any idea beyond just, well, I'll coil up some coax and use some zip ties and I've got a ballon. Yeah, you'll probably be okay, but you might, might not have the best one. All right, let's start with this one. This was in the article. This shows the four ways that, that, these, that these ugly ballons or coax, coiled coax ballons are made the classical way in the upper left there, which is to wind it on a piece of PVC pipe. You can either use a zip ties to hold it on the pipe, or as I like to do, I'd like to drill holes in the pipe and just run the coax through. These are all small two meter ballons, because uh, I make lots of two meter antennas and uh, made with mini eight or, or uh, RG58. I don't run it all the way into the shack, but at least good for the ballon. The one at the bottom left is the more com is a common form of the of the coiled coax ballon, the scramble, the scramble bundle, where you just take the coax and wind it a few turns and use some zip ties to hold it together. Works fine. I much prefer though when I do that to use the one on the right, upper right, called the torus knot. Um, you don't have to use any zip ties. You just take the coax and make a loop out of it and then pull the end around and shove it through back through the middle until it forms into a torus. You can make a, a very good coax ballon this way. In fact, frequently when I'm designing an antenna, I'll do this very thing and just take the pigtail and make a little torus ballon and then away I go. Or if like me, you uh, own a 3D printer or know someone who does, I've been making coil bobbins recently and there's one of my, as a two meter, my little two meter bobbin, I have a six meter bobbin as well. Uh, and if you want the STL files, be glad to send them to you. All right, there are four design concepts that you need to have to properly build these coiled coax ballons. Not difficult ones, I'm not going into a lot of heavy math, though I'll show you some math if you'd like to use it. It's not mandatory. Uh, but there are four, four design contexts when you decide to set out to build yourself an ugly ballot. Number one, and this is my favorite topic, what is the primary job of a ballot? I asked this at our ham breakfast before COVID shut it down. And of course I got the standard answer. Oh, well a ballot is to make unbalanced line into balanced line. Yeah, that's true. But that's not the primary job. <laughs> that's, that's a misconception, not a misconception, but it's the wrong view of a ballot. Let's ask ourselves, what is the primary job of a ballot? Because the balance to unbalanced is not the primary job. It's a secondary job. Okay, we all know that the term ballon comes from balanced unbalanced. It's an acronym put together from those two, from those two syllables. And yes, it's true, it does that. But to me, it, the very term itself hides the primary job of a ballot, which is what right down there at the bottom in the italics. The primary job of all ballots is to choke off shield current, outside shield current, or as we sometimes call it, common mode current, and to keep the current inside the coax. That's its primary job. Whether it's a four to one, a nine to one, or a one to one, that's what it's meant to do. 
keep the RF current that, that runs in your antenna from getting back onto the outside of the coax, which is can be a balanced or an unbalanced system depending upon uh, how you how you deal with it. All right, to understand this properly, let's look at this diagram. No, this is not this is not an advertisement for your local Target store, <laughs> or a, or a or a or an archery or an archery uh, a Target. This is a, the, a piece of coax cut sliced in half, and looking at it from the end and colored up here so you can see it to show the three primary elements which we all know: the center conductor in red, the outer shield in blue, and the dielectric in between, which is usually air or some kind of plastic foam or solid plastic. But what we forget to realize about coax is the effect of skin effect on coax. Now, most hams will tell you what skin effect is. It's just the fact that current in a conductor doesn't run primarily in the middle of the conductor, but because of the field, a little bit of field there in the conductor, it all runs to the outside. That's skin effect. We, we've heard of this for, all through our ham career. And if you look at the center conductor here, this is what it does to the current running in the center conductor. It doesn't run down the middle. It runs primarily right at the surface of the, of the center conductor or near the surface, it runs somewhat into the conductor. But it does the same thing to the shield. It turns, it, it, the current now the shield, because it's got two sides presenting itself, the current runs to both sides. Part of the current is running, it can run inside, and part of the current can run outside. In effect, skin effect turns the outer shield of coax into two wires, not just one. So a piece of coax is a three wire transmission line. That's very important to recognize that. And most hams don't have the foggiest notion that this is true. But a piece of coax is not a two wire transmission line, but a three wire transmission line. It has the inner, inner line, which is the center conductor. It has the inside of the shield, which is the second conductor the one we want to use, and it has a third wire, the outside of the shield, all created by skin effect. Okay, and here's the problem. Antenna current that's in that black antenna, your dipole out there, whatever the antenna is, running back and forth on the dipole. When it comes to the right there where the end of the coax comes, there's a connection. It's it's metal, it's, it's connected together. The, uh, the, the, ends, the ends of those two wires in, in the coax shield are connected together at the end. And therefore, that blue current coming from that side of the antenna, which is connected to the shield, can go two ways. It can go back down the inside of the coax where we want it, the only one we want, or it can run down the outside too. It's got two paths and it will take both of them if they're available. So you got to remember this, coax is a three wire unbalanced system unless we make it balanced by getting rid of that outside current. It's very much like doing this if you think about it. Here's a, here's a dipole fed with a balanced feed line, an open wire feed line. Coax is like adding another wire right there. Actually, just connecting, suppose you were to take that dipole that you got hanging up there with that balance line and hook another wire, the yellow wire there, onto that dipole, onto one side. What's going to happen? Well, it, it's a way for the current to flow, uh, the current coming back from the left there. But the question is, when you do that, what happens to the SWR? What happens to the tuning? What happens to the pattern, the radiation? pattern of that antenna when you hang that third wire on it. Well, depending upon how much that wire is, how long it is, and so forth, how long your feed line is, how grounded your feed line is, or it's lying on the ground, it's going to affect all of those things. You don't want this to happen. You don't want to have that third wire on your dipole, because it's going to bother the SWR. It's going to bother the tuning. It's going to bother the pattern. 
And if you and if you're talk, close talking your mic, it might even bite you in the lip. So what do we do? We put a choke in the outside shield, the outer part of the shield, in that separate green wire. Remember, the outside is separate from the inside in coax. And we can do it in two ways. We can use ferrite by putting sleeves around it or those clamp-on clamp -on beads, or we can coil the coax, make, it, make the outside of the shield into an inductor, which has AC resistance. And we can block the current on the third wire and eliminate it and turn coax back into a balanced line because the currents inside the coax are balanced. They're not unbalanced. The coax is only unbalanced when it's got that third wire. Now, some people ask me, where do you put the ferrites? This is a side question, but some people ask me, where do you put those ferrite chokes? I like, do you put them out just outside your shack right at your transmitter? Where do you put them? No, where's the problem occurring? Up at the antenna. I'm sorry, friends. The ballon has to go at the antenna, not down just outside your just outside the wall of your shack. You can put it down there, one down there if you want, but it's the one you want is up at the antenna. All right, getting through that basic theory there, which a lot of hams don't know, but getting through it, we now come to the second contact concept. How much coil do you need to use the coax to choke off the shield current? Well, it has to do with the inductive reactance of the coil. As I know, that's a high-powered technical term. It's just the AC resistance of the coil. You know, for DC current, there's only one kind of resistance. But to AC, there are three kinds of resistance. The resistance caused by a coil, the resistance caused by the capacitor, and the DC kind of resistance that we all know about. And it's called reactance for the, for the capacitor and the inductance, or symbol X sub L, inductive reactance. If it's capacitive, it's X sub C, capacitive reactance. Now, here's the rule. This is a rule to memorize if you're going to build coax balance. It's one to stick in your, in your ham toolkit. The inductive reactance of the choke made by winding a coil of coax needs to be four times the system impedance. What's the system impedance? 50 ohms. We all know that. 50 ohm system we're running. So the inductive reactance of the coil or the AC resistance of the coil that you make by coiling the outside of the coax needs to be four times the system, system impedance of Z0 or 50 ohms. It needs to be 200 ohms. Now you'll read in many articles that you can make it more. Don't do that, that's a mistake. It needs to be 200 ohms or roughly, roughly speaking 200 ohms. There's a, there's a disadvantage in making it more even though you'll often see people recommending 1000 ohms or 500 ohms. You can do that, but you're gonna run into some trouble if you do. Remember this 200 ohm valve. It's high enough to choke the current, but it's low enough to keep the, to keep the thing working correctly. You can go too high very easily. I'll show you later why. Okay, the first thing you have to do then is to figure out how much coil or how much inductance do you need in the coil to give you 200 ohms reactance. That's the first step in figuring out how to wind a ballot. A coax ballot. Well, if you if you like to do math, there's the formula at the bottom. The number of microhenries you need in that coil of coax, the outer shield of your of your ballot, is two pi times the frequency you're operating on divided by the reactance you want of 200 ohms. That's the formula. You can figure it out if you like working math. But I and I'm good at math, but I don't like having to calculate formulas. I make lots of mistakes when I do. So instead of that, I use this. On the internet, there are several of these, but this is the one I like the best. It's a little calculator that you can get from this, this British, this UK uh, firm, Electronics 2000 uh, in the UK. And this calculator is available. And as you can see, here's what it does. 
And if you want the URL, just aim your cell phone at the little QR code up at the bottom. It'll take you right to this one. Or you can write it down. It's there at the bottom. It lets you, it lets you find out what the, re, the, the inductive reactant, see the red letters there on the right, 202.947. That's close to 200 ohms. That'll be fine. It lets you figure out how many microhenries you need in that coil at the frequency you're operating. This is the example I had in the uh, in the article. So it's a 160 meter ballon, choke uh, coil ballon. It needs an inductance of 17 microhenries. Now, unfortunately, this calculator has to be worked backwards. You don't put in 200 ohms and it tells you how many microhenries. You have to keep putting in different values of microhenries until the X sub L is 200 ohms. It's just a matter of working it backwards several times, but it's simple enough to do. And this is what I did as I worked 1.9 megahertz backwards uh, until I got an output of two, uh, roughly 200 ohms. And that told me, okay, I have to wind my coax in a, into, a, into an inductor until it has 17 microhenries of inductance. Now, I've got to turn that inductance into a number of turns. Well, again, if you like the math, there's the formula. Uh, the, the turn squared is, is equal to the inductance times, uh, anyway. But I don't bother with calculating that. I used to do it when I was in university, but I, I, haven't, I haven't had a slide rule in years. I finally got rid of my slide rules, <laughs> even, the, even the hand calculators. I don't care to do the math. So again, there's an internet calculator that'll do the work for you. And this is it right here, the one that I like, again, with the QR code so you can find it. I don't have any numbers in this one, but in this one, you get the output. You wanna get your output in Henry's or micro Henry's, which you can set it to down there at the lower right to be that 17 micro Henry's or whatever it is for the, for the particular band you're working on that you got from the first calculator. And you have to keep putting in numbers of turns and the solenoid length. How do you figure, where do you get that? Well, that's just the diameter of your, of your coax times the number of turns. That's the length. Of, so if I want 10 turns and my coax is 0.4 inches in diameter, I put in a, a four inch length. And you got to convert it to centimeters. That's another, another problem here, but use the 2.54 centimeters to an inch. A bit of math, you got to do it, but it's pretty straightforward once you do it. Coil radius, well, you can figure that out. That's how big you want to make the form. You're Hermit talking to a bunch of Canadians, John. I think they can handle the centimeters. I think so. <laughs> displaced English people. <laughs> no, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an Anglophite myself. I wasn't born in England, but I lived over there for 10 years. So I'm very conversant with the, with the British environment, the empire. You know, there'll always be in England, yes. <laughs> I loved England, wonderful place. Uh, and I've been in Canada many, many times too. Okay, so the relative permeability here is basically one for air. So it'll take a little doing to learn to work this calculator, but you work it backwards until you get, until you get the thing at the bottom right there to read the number of micro Henry's that the first calculator figured out for you. It's a, just a little exercise you go through, but it works fine. Okay, that's the second concept: how to how to figure out how to figure out the uh, number of turns. But concept number three. Now, when I presented this earlier and in the article, I did not go into this. This is the new stuff. This is the stuff to really pay attention to, and I learned a great deal. One reader was kind enough to gently tell me that I. Why didn't you go into self-resonance? I said, go into what? <laughs> self-resonant frequency. So I looked into it and I finally realized, yes, I should have gone into it. However, it's not, it's not too difficult. We'll get to it, it's quite simple. But it's this, all coils, including the coil balance, have a, a self-resonant frequency, the SRF. They are a tuned circuit. And you have to pay attention to that when making these balance. Let's see, let's see what that is. Okay, here's a piece of coax. 
symbolized here by those things that look like resistors, they're really inductors. Uh, but we're just looking at the shield, the outside here. It has inductance because of the number of turns that you made there. It has the natural coil inductance of any coils, but it also has capacity between the turns, capacitive reactance between the turns. So you've got the two of them, inductance and capacitance together. What does that give you? A tuned circuit that has a natural resonant frequency. Any coil of wire or coax has a natural self-resonant frequency. And at, at a certain frequency, it right, the impedance rises to a maximum as all parallel tuned circuits do. And, but the interesting thing is, when that coil of coax reaches the self-resonant frequency, it ceases being a coil and becomes a capacitor. Yes, or the capacitance dominates. What does that mean? It means when you're making these balance, you have to keep the operating frequency below the self-resonant frequency to keep the coil inductive so it'll choke off the current on the outside. This is very important that you keep it that way. I'm gonna show you how to do that without a lot of math, but it's, it's, it's very important. Okay, and again, I use a calculator, which you can again get with the QR code up there if you want to. It's a little coil formula or a little coil calculator, which I like very much. It's called coil 64, or it's also called coil 32. You have two versions, a 32-bit version and a 64-bit version. And uh, you can get it there at that website uh, and uh, or just by searching for coil 64 on the internet, you'll find it. And it's a great little calculator. It lets you figure out the inductance of the coil, uh, any coil you want to build, whether it's coax or wire or anything by spacing and form diameter and wire size and all of that. And as you'll notice down there at the bottom, here's a, here's a, 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 a coil made for, uh, for uh, 1.9 meg or 1.6. It's a bigger coil than the one I had in the article. Uh, so it has only 14 turns on it. And, and the wire diameter is, you can see I have wire AG, AG number wire number one. Well, that's the diameter of LMR 400. It's about the same as number one wire. That's how you have to enter it into this. You have to find the coax diameter, find out what it is, look up in a wire table, what wire number is equivalent to that, and then you put it in here. A little bit of more math to do, but it's just busy work, or as my physics professor used to say, just turning the crank. Okay, don't worry about the insulation on it. Although you do need to know the diameter of the shield, not the diameter of the whole of the whole coax, because there because uh, there is some some insulation on the outside, and it's about 0.35 inches, I think, for LMR 400, or about 0.2 for uh, RG58. Um, oh, no, if that's 0.2, it'd be mini eight. But you see, when you run this little calculator, it'll uh, it will, again, has to be worked backwards. <laughs> but anyway, it'll give that 16.74 micro Henry's it's showing you there. But it will show you the coil's self-resonant frequency. And for this 160 meter coil that I, uh, that I, that I did here with a, on a piece of five inch diameter rather than four inch, which the article was, it has a self-resonant frequency of 10 and a half megahertz. That's certainly above uh, 160 meters. So this coil would be fine. And this is the way you find out whether your coil is okay. You check its self-resonant frequency with this little calculator. And if it's sufficiently above the frequency you're working at, the balance fine. However, you can make it a little better than just doing that. Because, and here's a nice rule of thumb to stick in your ham toolkit if you want to make these. You want to make the ballon square. What do you mean square? Wind it on, make a square turns? No, no, your turns can be round. A square coil is one that has the same height as the diameter. That's a square coil. That's a 160 meter 
That's a 160 meter uh, LMR or RG8 ballon wound on a piece of five inch pipe. That's that 14 turn coil that I showed you in the, uh, in the coil 64 a minute ago. It has a, and a, here's the point. Here's the point to remember, put this in your toolkit, flag this one, a square coil has the highest self-resonant frequency for that band. If you make it smaller in diameter or and longer, it has a lower self-resonant frequency. And if you make it too narrow, too long, or too big, it's going to get, your self-resonance frequency is gonna drop right down onto the band you're operating on and cancel the effect of the ballot. So make square ballots. That's, that's a great tip that I learned. I wish that I put it in the article, but I didn't. John, I got a question. Therefore, these ballots, which you'll see all over the internet, poor designs. They're poor designs. The one in the middle is the kind you might see might see on an HF beam. It's got too big in diameter. It's got too few turns. It's question. Yeah, I had a question there, uh, John. Um, given that the uh, the square, you know, uh, coil is going to give you the the best self resonant frequency. Uh, early on, you showed kind of that torus wound two meter uh, ballon. Uh, uh -huh. So when you have turns that overlap each other in multiple layers, as opposed to a single layer, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily going to be square for the same number of turns. So which is the better way to do it is to really make them flat and make a square or is overlapping them like that tor toroid uh, torus wound uh, thing a good way to go still? I mean, how is that going to affect good, the self-resident frequency? That is a good question and one that's frequently asked. Uh, the torus or the scramble wound ballon is just like the solenoid. This is a solenoid ballon. That's the proper term for it. If you take that same amount of wire that you'd put on the solenoid and crunch it into a bundle or a torus knot, it'll turn out to be pretty much the same inductance. The same length of coax will make it much the same. It'll have a little more inductance, in fact, than the solenoid will uh, by 10, 20% or something like that. So you might just want to figure out what the solenoid ballon is and then just bundle it. Take well, I, guess, the same. But I guess my question really was, how does that, how does that bu bunching of it up affect the self-resonant frequency? Is that going to bring it down? It has much the same square? effect as it, it has much the same effect as it does in the solenoid ballon. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's similar. Uh, I don't have the quantitative figures for that, but it is fairly similar. Uh, coiled or bundled, uh, uh, bundled or uh, torus wound ballons are, uh, are very similar to solenoid ballons, just a little bit more. Uh, I don't know what the peak would be with them, but it would be similar. So here's a good design. Here's one that I did. This is my six meter uh, 3D printed uh, little, uh, uh, little uh, uh, bobbin that I made. And again, if you want if you want the STL files for these, I'll be glad to send them to you. And my uh, my uh, email address will come up with a QR code here near the end. So uh, this is one uh, this is one at the bottom of an of a six meter antenna that will be in a near near future QST article. Um, and um, this is right at the base of the antenna. Obviously, that's a that's a ground tube, a piece of two and a half inch conduit buried in the ground with my water drill uh, standing right in front of the house. This is, where I, this is where I test all my antennas to see if the neighbors are gonna think they're ugly. <laughs> this, one, this one is well disguised too. Okay, now concept number four, and this is the last one about coiled coax balance. They have a disadvantage. They have a disadvantage compared to ferrite ballons. Ferrite ballons have an advantage over coax coiled ballons. It's not one you. It's not one you have to worry about if you use the formulas that are the principles I've given you. But you do need to be aware of it because of the self-resonant frequency of a coiled coax ballon. And we and we do need to look up that issue about the the, the bundle. I want to I want to, I want to investigate that one farther. Good question. Anyway, uh, because of that self-resonant frequency, coiled coax balance 
have a limited frequency range. It's about two to one, something like that. For example, if you build yourself a 160 meter ballot, it's only going to be good up to 40 meters. Now you'll read in all sorts of articles on the internet and they're wrong, that, oh, you can, a 160 meter ballot, it'll work for all bands. No, it won't. It has a narrow frequency rate because you run right smack dab into the middle of that self resonance. And when you do, you negate the ballot. So if you're going to make yourself a ballot, you want to make it, you can make it, you make it so it has a, you can keep it out of that self resonant frequency. For example, the 160 meter ballon will work on 80 meters and 40 meters too. A 40 meter ballon will work 40 meters, 20 meters, 15 and everything up to 10. A 10 meter ballon will work on six meters. A six meter ballon will work on two meters. But, uh, but just realize they are limited in frequency range. Whoops, I guess I dropped a slide here somewhere. <laughs> I got to that one. Oh, I'm going backwards. How, how the heck did I go backwards here? I got it made a mistake here in my PowerPoint. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, we'll get to here. This is where I want to go. Sorry about the, uh, the swapping of slides. Um, if you want really wide frequency range, if you want a ballon that's gonna cover 160 meters to 10 meters, you need to use ferrite. There isn't many, much of a way around it. This is a W2AU ballon uh, that I made from uh, uh, five, five uh, uh, ferrite sleeves that I got from Amadon Associates. Amadon Associates makes a nice ferrite sleeve ballon called a BA2. Uh, and it comes with six of those sleeves. And if you wanna go to 160 meters, you've gotta use a dozen of them. But remember, if you the ferrite has a nice wide frequency range, it doesn't suffer from that self-resonant problem. Unfortunately, ferrite ballons have a couple of disadvantages. They are obviously more expensive. That BA2 is uh, six of them is about thirty dollars or something like that. And ferrite ballons have another disadvantage. If you happen to want to tune up something through one of them that's way out of tune. In other words, you got high SWR in that coax. The, the ballon is good for choking off the, or for, for protecting you against the high SWR, but the ferrite will heat up if the SWR in the line is high. The coiled choke ballon won't. So a disadvantage of the ferrite is this is tendency to heat up. That's why if I'm running a, a ferrite ballon and uh, on, a, on a frequency that it's really, uh, the antenna is not really that well tuned and I'm using maybe a tuner in front of the ballon to tune it up, I'll go out and get my, uh, my infrared aiming uh, thermometer and put some, power to the, put some power to the antenna for a minute or two and then go out with, and go out with my IR thermometer and see if the ballon got hot. Or I can feel it with my hand, of course, but <laughs> that, that IR thermometer is a very good way to, uh, a very good way to see, not if you have, not, not only if you have COVID, but, <laughs> but to see if your ballons get hot. If you if you use nice big ferrites and uh, don't try to and don't try to run uh, wild long wires through a ferrite ballon, you'll be okay. And that's pretty much it. Those are the four tips. Here's one little final tip which I found quite handy. If you want if you want to make your ballon, your coax ballon, I like to make them out of vinyl jacketed coax. That usually means RG8 because I don't think LMR 400 comes in a vinyl jacketed version. It's it's PV, uh, P polyethylene jacket, better jacket. Vinyl isn't as good a jacket, but it has an advantage in making these balance. If you go down to the local hardware store and buy a buy a tube of this Permatex clear vinyl adhesive repair kit made for patching holes in your leather couches and stuff or your vinyl furniture. It's a wonderful glue for gluing coax together, vinyl coax. 
it's way, way better than silicone sealant, which is nasty and messy stuff. This vinyl adhesive will, will turn a bundled bundle of coax into a solid brick of vinyl very quickly. And that's it, folks. I'll leave my, uh, whoops, where'd it go? Why'd it do that? It quit anyway. Well, there it is. Again. All right. Yeah. So, and there, that's, folks, if you that's wanted... my email address there at the bottom in the QR code. Okay, that's it. Very good. Okay. Um, well, if you want to turn cameras on and get questions, I will ask one question myself, John. Uh, what's the impact of, say, suspending one of these uh, or mounting vertically, as I've seen in a lot of your slides, versus just letting it lie on the ground? Well, I guess I guess the ground is going to load the uh, is going to load the inductance. It's it's adding some extra resistance in there. I don't know how I don't know how severe the effect is. I don't think I'd do it though. I just I'd keep it off the ground, probably not far. Right, right. I have noticed um, we we did some calculations. I guess a couple of years ago. And we discovered that Nalgene bottles, not the one liter ones, but the harder to find 1.5 liter ones are nearly an ideal size. Yes, they uh, are. For a lot of HF frequencies. So you can end up um, just wrapping it around there. It's super easy and just tape it uh, straight to the bottle. Uh, it seems to work out really well and really fast field day fix. Yeah, PVC pipe uh, above four inches is a, hard to get and pretty expensive, at least in short pieces. I have a local hardware store or a lo local plumbing store that, that has fragments. So <laughs> that's where I scrounge big, big PVC. Given that you're 10 miles south of me, I'd like to know your local source. <laughs> oh, what is the, I know where it is. I forget its name. It's right oh. at the corner of, of Blosser and, 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 uh, and Betteravia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a question for you about uh, the ugly coils, the squished up, the uh, what did you call them, the uh, toroidal knots, um, but the torus, um, knot. torus knots. Anyway, making a coil and then using snap-on ferrites around that, is that kind of a good balance between using fewer ferrites so it's cheaper, but still getting the effect of the coil, but the ferrites increase the inductance, hopefully without increasing the capacitance for the self-resonance? I suspect that would work. I, it's, it's an idea that never occurred to me, but uh, interesting one. <laughs> because when I was when I was doing the math to try and figure out how many uh, ferrites you'd have to put in a line, because you know the the inductance of a coil increases with the square of the number of turns, right? right. So the and more the turns light. you put on it, you you get a, a very fast increase in inductance. And a linear inductor with those ferrites on it does is is a linear increase in inductance with the number of uh, ferrites on. That's correct. I don't know. It's an interesting thought. To <laughs> think about. Well, I hope one. it works because I've built several of them that way. Yeah, I mean, it's, oh, a, I'm it's sure. a pretty common thing. You're basically I'm fairly confident the, uh, it works fine. It's just yeah. a matter of how well or how to how to quantify it. How to calculate it exactly? What yeah. were you saying, Alan? Yeah, you're you're basically just making a uh, you know a ferrite cord inductor at that point, so it's a pretty yeah, sure. good thing to do, <laughs> and uh, it really just means that you're going to have to have a larger diameter ferrite, which costs more money, right? Yeah, so it yeah. comes down to to that trade off of 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 money versus how many how many turns you can fit through that uh, you know, fit through the core. I found I've got some um, one inch inner diameter ferrites that I bought from Mauser uh, clamp ons that I found I can fit four turns of LMR 400 Ultraflex through. Yeah. Fer Ferrite, the company that makes uh, ferrites, <laughs> has some wonderful uh, Mix 31 and Mix uh, 47 clamp-ons, which I typically use if I want to create a qu quick ferrite belt. <laughs> no, the name of that store is Ferguson's. Ferguson's, that's the name of it. Yeah, it's on the corner of... Uh, of uh, uh, Skyway and uh, and and Betteravia in Santa Maria. So John, it's Peter here. Uh, I'm running a multi-band vertical, 80 through 10, um, yeah. and I'm also running a, an elevated one for 80 and 40. And I'm on the contest right now, and these antennas are performing just super well for me. I'm I'm sure. uh, 
Yeah, I'm breaking pileups into Europe on a vertical running 100 watts. So I'm real pleased with these antennas. So I, I'm not worried about cost. I'm looking for performance. So I'm thinking that for both antennas, then I should be looking at that ferrite um, uh, formed uh, ballon for both of them then. Is that BA2, yeah. is it? Yeah, it's uh, Amadon Associates, and it's called a BA2. And uh, they're very, very handy. They come in a plastic bag with a bunch of these slip-on ferrites of a very reasonable, very good mix for HF, and a piece of heat shrink tubing as that you put around it and makes a very, a very durable outdoor ballon uh, to, to use. It. But... Uh, I forget what they cost. We can probably find out here. Let's let's just for fun go over here and do a, a share. And uh, let me close this down. And uh... okay. While we're looking that up. I'm actually going to call on Alan for a second and give us a quick commercial about what he's going to talk about next week. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So next week, um, I guess, uh, Rod, you were going to refer to it as scopes for dopes. Uh, basically it's a, an introduction to oscilloscopes, uh, what they are, how to set them up, how to use them. And we'll also talk a bit about uh, the choice between both analog and digital scopes then if we have time, we'll actually talk about a couple of uh, uh, different things you can do with a scope in your shack. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. And we'll see you, okay. we'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel, as they say. Okay. okay, John, have you found what we need? I'm looking for it here. I don't see it. They're not coming. Maybe they're not selling that gadget anymore. Okay. Well... Okay. Any you any further questions to, for John? You might have to just buy yourself a bunch of these. <laughs> I haven't Never. ordered one in quite a while, so they might have discontinued the item. Okay, John. Well, thank you for a great presentation. I love the graphics. It's very clear. Uh, I think that's going to do very well publicly, but thank you for sharing with it first. Uh, and remember, uh, remember, just a minute, Rod. And remember, send me critical comments on this presentation because I do want to polish it up for the ARRL. Anything you didn't like about it, or you'd think I should add or take away, or, or the graphic, you didn't like the graphic. I do like those comments. They're very valuable. Uh, I get too many people to say, oh, that was a good presentation. Well, it didn't help me fix it. <laughs> okay, sorry for the commercial. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll move on 